You're listening to Druidcast episode 197. Hello my friends and welcome to Druidcast episode 197. I am your host Dave the Bard and Druidcast is brought to you on or around the 20th of the month by the Order of Bards, Ovates and Druids. If you want to find out more about membership to the Order and our courses you can do that at our website which is at druidry.org. Opening the show, you heard Lefreya from Skyhenge. Lefreya means God of Life in the old Saxon tongue, and the lyrics consist of three runic prayers chanted cyclically, building to the final release of harmony. Thank you for sending that in, Josh. I've noticed a real increase in the interest for the study of Old English, me included in that. So it's lovely to be able to play some on the show. Well, Samhain is on the horizon here in the Northern Hemisphere, linked with that time of Halloween, a time associated with witches and witchcraft. So I thought it was about time to invite author and Wiccan Jason Mankey back onto the show to talk about his path. So for this interview, it's time to pop on a steam train to London. Go on, just go along with me on this, yeah. Along an old cobble street filled with horse-drawn carriages to an oak door to a London magician's club. <laughs> Climb the stair to the library and take a seat in one of those old leather chairs and join me for a good discussion on magic, folklore and the tales of the old pagan horned god. Pan. The talking bit. 
Hello, uh, Druid cast listeners. I am sitting here in the London uh, Magicians Club, reclining on an old leather chair, uh, smoking a pipe and enjoying a rather nice single malt surrounded by old bookshelves on oak. And and with me is the uh, a ma- magician from the United States of America sitting on the opposite side of the, uh, the Magicians Club chair here. So welcome, Jason, to this club. How are you, my friend? friend i am doing well my friend it's so good to see you and chat with you i tr- i wanted to do a voice but it's too early for me here in the united states <laughs> yeah no i'm gonna stop now as well to be honest with you but it's about eight o'clock isn't it? Eight, eight or nine a.m yeah it's about almost nine thank you for coming back on druid cast always a pleasure to talk to you always a pleasure to see you jason it's been like i think we were saying since 2019 since we actually sat down in the same room together at paganicon um yeah yeah and then and then as we said the world changed and everything went a bit different for a few years didn't it and uh it did. and before that i'd seen you like for three years in a row because that's we right it's g together and the yep. tp was burned down which was sad 2018 i went to your house and yep. stayed with you carrie and then 2019 paganicon and then the world turned and then that's <laughs> it and we haven't seen each other since you know i've been keeping up with your travels though it's good facebook is good like that to do that kind of thing so what i'd like to do is talk to you about your path you know um and let's start with that really you know how how would you how would you describe your path to listen as a druid cast i would say that i'm a wiccan witch Wicca is a type of witchcraft, and I've always thought of myself as a witch, but Wicca is a particular set of perhaps rituals and ways of thinking, and that's what I've always been attracted to. And I've flirted with other traditions and paths, but the Wiccan way of doing things has just always appealed to me. So yeah, Wiccan witchcraft is what I like to use. Wiccan witchcraft. And going back to the beginning, how how did you discover your, you know, your spiritual path? It all starts in 1990 with the Led Zeppelin box set. Oh. That was released, yeah. You know, I was a hair metal guy, but I was like, I need to go back and get the classics. And that box set came out at Christmas of that year. And I fell in love hard with Led Zeppelin, was obsessed with Led Zeppelin for several years. Maybe I still am. And when you read about Led Zeppelin, though, you read about Jimmy Page and his interest in Aleister Crowley. You read about Robert Plant and his interest in Celtic myths. So I wanted to get all into that. And I was at a bookstore in St. Louis, Missouri once, and I stumbled across a book called Celtic Magic by DJ Conway, which is not a good book in any way. You know, she argues that the Celts practiced Wicca, which we know is not true, but she was a good writer and it had sort of the basics of Wicca. And I bought it because I thought it would get me closer to the mind of Robert Plant. And within four days, I was saying prayers to the goddess and it and just that was that? changed completely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you and me both. Do you remember Tippa Gore? You know, she when when those little stickers yeah. started to appear on CDs, and they said, you know, rock music will lead you down the path of the occult. Well, I think you and me, we are both living proof that she was right because we. Yes, she was. She was absolutely right. <laughs> because with you, it led Zeppelin. With me, it was Black Sabbath and uh, and Rainbow and Ronnie James Dio's lyrics and all that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, that was so. So before that box set, though, did you have any other kind of interest in in magic or or spirituality? You know, what, was there something before that really? There really was. So it's kind of a a story in two parts. I would always been interested in cryptids when I was a little kid, Loch Ness Monster, Bigfoot. And if you know anything about American libraries, right next to those books are the books on witchcraft, vampires, werewolves, UFOs. So I read all of those books and had read some books, you know, kind of kind sort of defining witchcraft very sensational for kids not like they introduced me to gerald gardner but i do remember reading about alex sanders in one of them and that was in elementary school and then between the summers of seventh and eighth grade so i'm like 12 years old maybe 13 i checked out a book from the library called cast your own spell by Sybil leak and it mentioned wicca in that book and witchcraft and the triple goddess and things so i was had been exposed to things a little earlier than the celtic magic book but i was very active in my local church youth group i lived in the american south became president of my methodist church youth group i really wasn't ready for witchcraft back Mm. then 
but at least I knew what it was. And I'd always been interested in alternative spiritualities. And I'd never understood Christianity with the idea that, you know, our path is the only path and everyone else is wrong. That's just Mm -hmm. something I could never buy. I always assumed there were many different, you know, pathways to the divine. Certainly, if you're a really smart God, why would you cut off over half of the population? That just mm-hmm. never made any sense to me whatsoever. So, you know, even in high school, I would read about Hinduism, Islam, Buddhism, all those kind of things. I always had this big interest in comparative religion. But using the words pagan and witch is a big step. Yeah. A lot yeah of right. So I wasn't yeah. ready for that step until I was 21 years old. Yeah. Did you have a religious family around you? You know, was was there an influence like that to so that interest in 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 spirituality and religion not really my grandmother was pretty religious but she would often take us to sunday school and then skip church to make breakfast for the family right and my dad was never religious you know i liked religion you know i I kind of liked some of the, the trappings of church periodically but my family wasn't really religious my stepmother played lip service to the idea you know but didn't mm. really walk the walk or talk, you know, she talked the talk, but didn't walk the walk. Yeah. Yeah. Would you say that your, your wicker was a spiritual path, a religious path, both? It, it's definitely spiritual, but I think it's religious first and foremost. And I, right. I think that word has really fallen out of favor. Yeah. But I think if you, you know, honor deities and have a particular worldview, I think that's a religion. So for me, it definitely is a religion. And I grew, you know, I think we're of the same age. And in the 90s, when you would read these books, it was always like witchcraft is a religion, right over and over and over again in a lot of them. And and now that's sort of fallen out of favor. But for me, yeah, very much a religion. Yeah, I think religion, probably that word has such associations with with negativity and, you know, violence and disagreement and, uh, right. you know, and I think spirituality is a much safer word, but essentially I think a lot of the time what the people are saying is very similar, you know, and I think religion just means bringing people together. I think that's the kind of root of that word is to, to bring people together. Um, which it doesn't seem to do, does it? It seems to separate people book before last. I think it was, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. You, your last one was the Greek gods book, but the book before last was all about the, the horned god of the witches. There was, was even right? one in between those. There two. was another one in between. Oh, well, it's too late to edit that out. So there we go. Yeah, it's, it's fine. There are nine. I get them confused. Now. <laughs> <laughs> but you had the horned god of the witches, which is a, a good tome, and it, it it really goes into some incredible depth with exploring the horned god um your your view it feels in 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 the book is that these these horned gods are very distinct separate deities from different lands um apart from that you know tell me about a, a kind of formative relationship with the horned god where did that come from it came about because of him i didn't want to worship a horned god you know that was like the one thing that was sort of left over from christianity uh that's the devil that's not what you want i always thought you know i'm gonna worship a god like apollo right flowing blonde locks i'm gonna worship apollo that seems safe that's what i want and there was just sort of this energy this insistence you know that you are going to talk about the great god pan you are going to honor pan in ritual you're going to say his name and you know you're you're just going to have to acknowledge him and i put it off for a long time it was just something i didn't want to do you know but i would be in ritual and i would just feel this thrum like pan 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 and then finally in ritual i just kind of yelled his name once we were all a little bunch of college kids and just sort of made things up as we went along so you could basically do whatever you wanted doing ritual so i just screamed the name pan and i felt this energy kind of fall into me and it reminded me of the first time i'd ever prayed to the goddess i felt something very similar like this power Mm. that i could feel this energy that was acknowledging me and allowing me to acknowledge it and that was really kind of the beginning of the love affair and then other horn gods follow you know i'm a believer in the horn god is this bigger figure but i also honor separate antlered and horn gods like pan and kernonos Mm. as well it's all very complicated you know yeah yeah are you a polytheist or you know are are you a neoplatonist or whatever right i mean it it's deity i assume it's greater than us and operates in different ways than we do 
and we find our own way of connecting to it in whatever way we we can or or do so from what you've just said you know your your connection to the to the feminine principle for the goddess came before your 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 uh, connection with the horned god so how did that come about it was all reading that book celtic magic you know right. that okay. it's weird how formative that book was and as you know we've both said it's a terrible book but you know it had this principle of the goddess in it and when you think about the world half you know there are a lot of women in the world right the idea that mm. deity should be entirely male and exclude over half the world seems really silly so it made a lot of sense to me to worship a goddess very very quickly and when i was starting out for the first three or four years that was really my focus entirely was goddess worship i yeah. wanted to be close to her and everything i did was really about her and then there was the the thrumming and i didn't have yeah. much choice yeah but so you, you're, you're you're saying that the goddess as the feminine principle and then there's pan and so you name the horned god but you aren't naming your goddess I, I think it was because when I was, you know, starting out, it was always the goddess, right? Yeah. Capital G, the goddess, maybe O triple goddess, right? So, and everything was really focused on goddess, the lady, the mm. lord, not specific names. But by the time I kind of got to Pan, I'd been doing this for a couple of years and I've been reading more myths and things and sort of was beginning to talk about deities and very spe with specific names. About this time, too, I began to really like the goddess Bridget, you know, so there was that sort of um, shift into naming a particular goddess instead of just saying the goddess. Mm -hmm. But for a long time, it really was that sort of bigger picture, you know, like the charge yeah. of the gods come to life by yes. Dory Valiente or something. With all those names, it's a, that's a beautiful piece of prose, isn't it? Absolutely beautiful. So Pan was there knocking on your door finally said his name, shouted his name in ritual. I'm sure a lot of listeners to the show will have kind of experiences like when finally you you just say, okay. <laughs> yeah. um, with me, I, I remember I my, my path into that was um, ceremonial magic, right? Now, ceremonial magic, if you have a kind of nominal Christian background, is actually fairly, fairly safe because a lot of it is based around the Kabbalah, a lot of it is based around the, the Tree of Life. And it was for me quite a big step to suddenly open a book on paganism and see Pan again. Weirdly enough, Pan again sitting there on his on a rock playing his pipes with his cloven hoof. And in the back of my mind, I was I could I could feel that call as well. You know, I could feel that call as well. That call of, I guess, like the earth and mud and nature, it felt like to me, just, you know, really getting back to to the absolute roots of what it is to be human um, or human animal, should I say, you know. Why do you think Pan? I think it was Pan just because he's so very different than I am. You right? know, that sort of primal, feral energy that go out and, and get whatever you want, that very insistent energy. And I've always been very polite. Yes, ma'am. No, yeah. sir sort of standing in the background and things and you know so having him in my life sort of gave me the courage and the energy to write books and to do talks you know to talk to people do workshops go on podcasts or whatever else it is like yeah. i needed him in my life like it was incomplete i think before that so i yeah. think it was and i also think if you read his myths i mean there's this he's this very insistent god right i'm going to try to get what i want and if he wants you he's going to get you eventually <laughs> you know and he'll wear you down and he'll come in the door. He's one of those deities, I think, you know, that, that a lot of our modern pagan path, I think, owes a, a great deal of thanks to people like Arthur Machen and and those Victor you know, and the Victorians who who looked for Pan within nature and brought him in. No matter how wrong historically it may have been, it felt to me, it feels to me looking back that there are times in history where humans need something, you know, and it may not match the original story of of arcadia and, and and greece and all of those but but somehow in our modern society we need an energy because of something that's happening with or it's climate change or our attitude to to other life forms and it just feels to me like that energy came through in those writings of those 
like I say, you've got the great God, God Pan book and all those, and and we're we're kind of still riding that wave. Do you, do you reckon that's how it was? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated by the rebirth of Pan, that you have this sort of rustic Greek god become the god of the English countryside <laughs> and praised by English poets. And they transform him into something that's really different than what he was in the ancient world. And to me, mythology doesn't end. Like gods are not stuck in amber. They're not exactly like they were in the year 300 BCE, right? So in a way that poetry about pan is new pan mythology mm. right it's a different way of looking at the god so that you can experience the god and grow closer to him and you know jesus is not a very good link to the natural world mm. right i mean you know maybe he talked to shepherds or something i don't know but yeah. like he's not a great link to the natural world and these people needed something and they settled on pan because you mm. know he has those hooves of a goat and those legs and stuff, right? I mean, it's just very natural to see yeah. him and all that. And yeah, so it makes sense to me. And yeah. that language in those poets poems is what we still use when we do ritual to talk about the horn god. I think it's been super influential. And a lot of people are really, really unaware of the influence of that poetry. Yeah. You know? And some of those people in the 19th century, I'm pretty sure were pagans. You just right? couldn't I mean, say it, you know. Yeah, I couldn't say it. Yeah. A couple of letters here and there that really hint at it uh, amongst, like, Shelley and stuff, but really early on. Yeah. yeah I, I love that. It, your, your thoughts are like my thoughts. Yeah. I, 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 and I, I remember when I first came to this path, there were, there were two books that everyone said you, was, you must read, and that was The White Goddess and The Golden Bough by Fraser, you know, and and everyone said, these are the books that are going to like, you know, you're going to, these are going to guide you down the path. They're absolutely astounding. And about, I guess it was probably more, well, I, lo I lose two years because of the pandemic. So I guess it was more like six or seven years ago. I felt, I started to hear words like, there are two books you must not read. <laughs> 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 and those are The White Goddess by, by uh, and, and The Golden Bough. And I read both back in the day, and I couldn't help but pick up the same feeling as I got from reading those those Victorian poets, you know, that there was something that needed to come out, and it may not, again, have been historically accurate, but it was something, there was a zeitgeist going on at the time that needed to be expressed in words. And I think that those two books, to me, they still... They don't hold historical fact, no, but they are in, they're still inspiring, you know, to this day of, 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 of something like an, a, an expression of what was needed in the, at the time. Yeah. yeah I mean, Graves with the white goddess. I mean, he was never really trying to write history. He was no. just trying to write what he thought was poetry, right? In prose form. Yeah. And to make it as inaccessible as possible to most <laughs> readers. But there's a real beauty to it. And I'm with you. I mean, I think that, you know, these myths speak to us mm. and maybe they're not historically true, but there's something inside of us that relates to them and yeah. they speak the truth in a different way. Yes. And if, you know, if you, if you look at folk songs, for instance, you know, the um, a folk song sung in one village may be completely different to the folk, folk song sung in the other village, but the, the, you know, um, Francis Child or the Copper family or these folk song collectors only spoke to Kevin in village A and didn't go to Jonathan or or Amanda in village B. So her version of that song died out and that one was then written down and suddenly that becomes the truth. That becomes the absolute origin of the story. And I just always think that that's the same with mythologies as well. You know, the stories, that the actual mythologies that we have, we've, we've inherited are probably just one of a myriad of different versions of the tales that were told all over the place, you know, it, and, and of Pan being one of them, I think. As yeah. someone who wrote a book about the Greek gods, it's really interesting to me how most people don't really know about the truth of the myths. I mean, they were very different from city state to city state. And because of writers like Bullfinch, we have this sort of sanitized idea that this story really works and everything links up in a way and it all sort of makes sense. But that wasn't the way of it at all in the ancient world. I mean, 
So what, uh, what was that? What was it? Was it animistic? Was it more animistic, you know, linked to um, landscape just, or something? It just, the God, the stories of the gods were really different from place to place, right? Instead of this very organized way of looking at them, mm. you know, and how a god was seen could be very different. Like, you know, in Athens, for instance, they didn't like Ares very much. But if you were in Thebes, Ares was really, really important, you know, right. so it was just sort of different. And goddesses like Aphrodite, for instance, you know, we always think of her maybe as being a trifle, you know, or flighty or something, obsessed with how she looks. But, you know, there were times when she carried a spear. Julius Caesar wore an Aphrodite ring. I mean, people thought that she was very fierce in her own way. Hera's mythology makes her out to be extremely unlikable, and yet worshipers loved Hera. They felt close to Hera, that there was like a like a real sort of comforting energy to Hera. So mm. sometimes the myths take away from how the gods were seen in the ancient world or present a view that isn't really how they were seen everywhere. I mean, I think a lot of what we look at is, oh, that's Athens. But Athens wasn't the only city-state. I mean, things were different in Sparta. Things were different in Thebes. Mm. And I guess, you know, being in the UK or America and, and worshipping and working with Pan also is different, you know. Do you think it's connected with – the way you connect with Pan, is that reflected with the land that you walk on, you know, by walking on the land of the United States of America? Is there an influence on that? I think how he expresses himself is a little different from place to place depending on where you are. But, I mean, I certainly feel him here. Yeah. You know, there are places where I'm really convinced that he's at in California, where I live. I mean, mm. I'm convinced that the Greek gods have moved out to Northern California a long time ago, and they all live here now. I mean, ah. We make a little wine. You know, we can control the tech industry. You know, I'm pretty sure that they set up shop here. <laughs> so where would be the Mount Olympus in, in California? In Northern California, the Mount Olympus to me, like where Zeus is, is the Bay Bridge, which connects San Francisco and Oakland. And okay. The, bridge, the bridges. It's like the the spot that connects everything. Yeah. And Zeus was the god that connected all the other gods to each other. You know, we're talking American gods by Neil Gaiman here, aren't we? I don't yes, know. Yes, we are. We are. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Let, I mean, I know you have an, a connection with uh, Dionysus. Um, and... I can't help but feel that one of those connections, I was at PSG years ago with you, and you did a, a Jim Morrison ritual. And I couldn't get to it for whatever reason. I can't remember why I couldn't get to it, but I saw it on the on the program. I thought, I've got to get to a Jim Morrison ritual. He's a big hero of mine as well. But I wasn't there. Now, is, is that ritual hidden under some occult kind of shadow that you can't talk about unless you actually was at the ritual? Or could, what was No, no, no. <laughs> I was at a PSG in the 90s, and there was a man there who was doing a Jim Morrison ritual. It was in the program, and I went. And then Jim Mad Dog Runnels was his name, and he passed maybe 10 or 12 years ago. But he was doing it, and he just sort of played like a Doors Greatest Hits CD, and we read some poetry. We did some things. And I, I was taken by it, though, because I love the Doors. And I think musically, the Doors are great for ritual. Nothing else sounds like the Doors. Mm. And I was like, this could be better. Like, I could make it a little more theatrical. I could make sure that whatever I was doing was synced up with the music that's playing at the time. You know, like, if you're going to cast a circle and start the ritual, you got to play Break On Through, right? Mm -hmm. And we call the goddess. We would we play, uh, hello, I love you. Won't you tell me your name? Awesome. You know, <laughs> call Dionysus. We'd play a uh, whiskey bar. Show me the way to the next whiskey bar. And... <laughs> So started doing these rituals. And the idea of the ritual is that Jim Morrison is the 20th century incarnation of Dionysus. He wants you to walk the path of excess, but there's also a lesson in it. Like there's only so far you can go on the mm. path of excess or you fall, right? And even in the myths of Dionysus, he's like, here is the great, enjoy, inebriate yourself. But if you went too far, you could do bad things or wake up with a hangover. And he didn't want you to abuse these gifts. He wanted you to find pleasure in them. So that was sort of the idea of the Morrison ritual. So Jim is Dionysus, and basically we just call Dionysus. And then we call Ariadne Aphrodite. Ariadne is the wife of Dionysus, but also is connected to 
Aphrodite, and sometimes in the ancient world, goddesses and gods sort of kind of merge together. And Ariadne Aphrodite is an example of that. And we always call Eris to Discordia, because mm. if you don't, she just shows up. And she's much <laughs> nicer when she's invited. So <laughs> we do all that part of the ritual. And then the mean, the meat of the ritual is you can be initiated into the Jim Morrison clan if you're a new like ritual goer. And we give you Mardi Gras beads, and then you get to pick a Morrison name. So then you're like whoever Morrison, right? <laughs> Eris Morrison, Couch Morrison is a Morrison, you know, lots of names. And sometimes people make out during the ritual. People, you know, drink, of course, during the ritual. If you've been initiated, you can be reinitiated into the clan because that's fun. You know, and we're just playing Doors songs while we're doing it. And the guy who originally did it, he would like take some beer and baptize your head, which mm -hmm. I thought was pretty gross to do at a festival. <laughs> So a friend of mine and I, we came up with the Mardi Gras beads and I've been doing Mardi Gras beads. Yeah. So I missed out getting my Morrison name. I will never get my Morrison name. There you go. What can I do? It, it was really interesting doing it at PSG because the first time I did it at PSG, I almost got kicked out of PSG. Oh. So I, well, I was a young, dumb kid. And while we were doing the Morrison ritual, I was like, we should all be taking some acid, man. You know, and I was just kidding around. And the security guy heard me. And he thought that I was like dealing drugs uh, and they were going to kick me out of PSG. And I was like, you can go through my tent. There's nothing here. And eventually I'd made friends with somebody who was on staff and talked him down. But Selena didn't even know about this. And when uh, I told her the PSG we were at, she just laughed, <laughs> just laughed really hard. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> it's like, that was the longest four hours of my life. And here you are laughing at me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, hopefully I will be able to attend a Jim Morrison ritual at some point. Well, that sounds amazing. Sounds amazing. I wrote a, a song called Time Machine, and one of the places I would go would be to see a classic Doors performance. I hope it wouldn't be one of those things that disappointed you. Do you know what I mean? You just right, kind of yeah. you build up these things, and you if, if I ever really did get the chance to go back, um, I don't think it would. I think he was just such a showman. Um, absolutely incredible. So you are in California. Yeah. Um, what is it? What is, is there something within your, your Wiccan path? How does that help you to connect with the land beneath your feet and your locality, for instance? It was a challenge because, you know, I'm not from California. I've lived right. here for 12 years. I grew up in the American South near Nashville, Tennessee, and in the Midwest. And when we read books about the wheel of the year and how, culture portrays the wheel of the year it's very sort of english and american northeast right? right these these are the cycles of agriculture it's going to snow at christmas time it's going to be hot at this particular point it's going to be cold and colder in october it's going to be 90 here on thursday so it's not colder here in october and that's really tough to deal with uh, mm -hmm. so I began to really sort of reevaluate my place on the wheel of the year when I moved out here, trying to connect to the rhythms of this place, which were very different than the rhythms of Michigan. And I think that my witchcraft has allowed me to do that because mm. it, it allows me to get closer to where I am, to feel the energies of the place that I am, so I can sort of adjust my wheel of the year as yeah. needed. Yeah. So did you say 90 degrees? Yes, not Celsius, but Fahrenheit. I don't no, know I know, I know. That's we're going to melt. It's still pretty hot, though. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. and and so Samhain is approaching. What kind of temperatures do you get in at, you know at the time of Samhain? Hopefully 60, 70, You know, you right. don't know. A little but cooler. The thing, the thing about where we are, like the hottest months of the year are August, September, and like usually the first half of October. Wow. So in September, when everybody's like excited about fall. You know, that's when we're maybe having a 95 degree heat, you know, wave for four wow. or five days. That's you know? amazing. So, yeah. so that is really fascinating. And I, and one for me, one of the biggest gifts. I was asked once if, if people from the future could look back at what we did 
with paganism in when it was right in its i mean we're we right at the beginning here really aren't we it's a little seed in our hand still and if people in a th in a thousand years time look back to us and say what from what we do now would you want to still be practiced in a thousand years time as like an ancient practice mm -hmm. of ancient wiccans and druids because we will be the ancient wiccans and druids at some point and for me it'd be the wheel of the year you know i mean it really would still be the wheel of the year because but what i've noticed when i come to the states when i go to australia particularly as well you have to develop your own relationship with it you can't just pick up the south of england gardener you know um right wheel of the year and plonk it somewhere else and say that's it and so you know snowdrops come up in february and all that kind of stuff however those points i still think can be relevant to the locality you're living in so do you feel do you feel the veil thin in california at Samhain? absolutely i mean i feel the sabbath still it's just that you know they're different a little bit yeah. but you still you still feel that change of energy in early September, I think, you know, maybe yeah. it's not the 68 degrees that I would have wanted it to be in the Midwest and it's, you know, 90 instead or whatever, but there's still like this energy that changes. Yule still feels like Yule, even though I can just walk down the street without having to put a coat on a mm. lot of the time. I mean, the energy still shifts. And one of the things too is like the sun still changes right the days are shorter the days are longer the days are equal and that amount of sunlight i think has a big impact on us and how we see things there's still something very powerful about it becoming night earlier and yeah. earlier and yeah. earlier no matter how warm it might be so yeah. so yeah i think we still keep up with it you know it's just you know in bulk to us really is the height of the rainy season that's when it's green here is in bulk March, right. April, and then in the summer when people are like, oh, it's so nice out and everything's green. Everything here is dead. Yeah. It hasn't greened for five months. Yeah. Right. So you just yeah. look at it differently, but you still feel those energies. Yeah. You know, summer yeah. feels a certain way. Autumn feels a certain way. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so during summer, it is really, it's just like you say, brown. Do you, do, the, do you have any, <laughs> this is a real, ignorant british person question coming up i'm really sorry but i'm gonna have to ask. are there fields of well we would call it corn um but uh, i think you it, it, would it be wheat or maize to yourself i mean what, what would it be they i'm not sure corn. Yeah. yeah so not, are, are there any of those or do you still have a when is the harvest i guess was is the question where is the where is the harvest in 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 your locality that's a great question because one of the things about where we live is the harvest is year round Right. It's just different things are harvested. So there's a lot of citrus plant, a lot of citrus trees. So in January, we get oranges, tangerines. And then in June and July, we get stone fruits like peaches, you know, and that's about the time we get our first like good tomatoes that come out. There's green bean season, which I really like. A lot of root vegetables in the winter, along with the citrus. California produces 90% of Cal of the United States is agriculture, but it produces like all of the weird things that aren't green. <laughs> yeah. So like you can drive like not too far from where I live and like see giant fields of artichokes, for yeah. instance, or something. So there's a harvest season, but it's it's year round. So we have a local farmer's market that I love visiting because then you sort of see what is in season where we're at. Mm -hmm. and. We, we get excited. I love apple season. We're in apple season right now. It's short in California, but I love it. And there's like different varieties of apples that they grow out here than they grew in. We lived in Michigan because mm -hmm. the climate's different. So we're adjusting to the apples, which I really like. Yeah. Blueberry season is earlier here than it was when I lived in the Midwest. You know, so there are all these different things. So, and so I do we, gardening too. So like, you know, we have tomatoes that we're bringing in right now and we had cucumbers earlier and things so it really is all year round yes yeah. so there's no where i live it's uh you know grain harvest and fruit harvest <laughs> that's probably about yeah. it really <laughs> yeah yeah i know I, one of the things that's happened um over fairly recent years i think is is a, is a shift and a very welcome shift to more inclusivity in uh, in paganism and um you know obod has looked at it and druidry has looked at it and i think that in in the past wicker has been seen as a very duotheistic um masculine feminine balance yeah. 
you know how what have you noticed within wicker over the over recent years that kind of is it i'm sure it is is it trying to address a balance of inclusivity absolutely as a tradition yeah absolutely i i think things are changing you know there i mean there's still a lot of that lord and lady but now it's about the lord and the lady and everything that lies between mm. those those poles right so it's everybody the gods are reflective of everyone yeah you know, whether they're straight gay trans non-binary there's a place for everybody in the circle and i think especially sort of a younger generation and i'm 50 and i consider myself part of that younger generation which really seems wrong but you know but we're out there and we're seeing what we do change and yeah. becoming more accepting and giving everybody a place in the circle in the united states there's a lot of fighting about that from small groups who are very very loud you know which is a real shame but i want everybody to be in the circle i want us all to be together yeah and, yeah you know and i think we have to change our language sometimes too to make that i don't want to ever use language that alienates somebody mm. right like, i don't see myself reflected in what we're doing yeah and i want to make sure that everybody sees themselves reflected in what we're doing yeah, me, myself and Carrie, we've been holding open rituals for years. You, you came up the hill to where we hold them at uh, by the Longman of Wilmington, and one of the challenges was always Beltane. Funnily enough, it was the, it was always Beltane because, particularly here as well, south of England, you have the old traditions of the May Queen, you know, and the May King, and all that kind of stuff. And and we just we just heard people you know just say that, that maybe they didn't feel quite as included as as other people um we also used to split off into two circles of men and women uh, yep. to explore you know male and female mysteries and stuff like that and of course some people just didn't know which one to go to you know or do, or which one would they be welcome at and and it would it it would have been quite complicated so we we changed the main making and queen to be uh, the spirits of Awen and Nuivre of creativity and life force. And we just, but, the, and to some, to people who want to still connect to those energies as making and queen, they still can. But for those of you that, that find that more difficult, then really you still have that twin energy of coming together and, um, but with no gender aspect attached to it because it was unnecessary and we had a beautiful thing happen because of that because we used to have a a hunt that the men used to go on and the women used to hold the energy of a cauldron where they chose the may queen and it was separate and and one year a little girl said to her dad and it was overheard by a lot of people said why can't i go on the hunt daddy and an and alarm bells went off in mine and Kerry's head at that moment, you know, and, and we just thought, well, that's why can't she go on the hunt, you know? And right. so we started to shift things and change things up from that moment onwards. And, um, and one last year, everybody queues up to go to the hunt and everybody can, and therefore chase down the life force and everybody can, engage with the awen of creativity as well and something happened that could never have happened before and i don't know statistically how it would have happened but from 65 70 people the same person received both and that would never have happened before and it was just a, a real celebration you know of kind of of diversity and inclusivity and uh i think we finally cracked it with that one <laughs> You know. uh, your Beltane's the hardest, though, I think, of all of them, because, I mean, I think, you know, you growing up and there's these expectations, the male, female, you know, maypole thing. We used to do sort of chasing like the goat boys would chase the young maidens and stuff. And I began to realize like how weird that was and how not inclusive that was. And we stumbled upon like an old Scottish ritual of, you know, running cattle through between fires or making cattle jump over fires at Beltane. So that's what we started to do. We turned it into a protection. Yeah. Sabbath, yeah. You yeah. know, and maybe with my wife and I, it's still, you know, a naughty Sabbath, but we just do that in private. I think that's the thing is when you do the open rituals and things like that, it needs to be inclusive when they're open and stuff. What you do personally is entirely up to anybody, you know, that's, that's yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. We're doing the you, green and gray thing. Like, <laughs> yes. <that's, laughs> So I finally got onto um, TikTok 
you know, I'm down with the kids now. I've got, I'm on there. I'm not posting frequently, but I'm on there. And I just get this impression there seems to be a shift away from initiatory traditions. Um, and I don't know if that's what I'm just picking up because of the people who come up on my feed or from what I see on on Facebook. But do you still think that initiatory traditions have a, have a place within like paganism of these days? I think it's still there. I just think people come to it later. You know, I think one of the things, too, about the, our magical community today is there are more and more solitary practitioners. So to be an initiate, you can't be a solitary practitioner. You have mm -hmm. to do you have to do things in a group, really, to be initiated. I mean, you could have maybe a self-initiation. But when we're talking about initiation, we're usually talking about those groups. And I think people get there. They just get there in their 30s or their 40s, maybe even their 50s or 60s, you know, mm -hmm. when they want to maybe see if there's something that takes what they do up to a higher level. You know, I do think there is that resistance to organized groups, right? We talked before about how religion is not popular. So the idea of joining a group where there are a couple of people in charge just doesn't appeal to people. And I think that's fine. You know, whatever mm -hmm. makes people happy. But I think they're still there. Sometimes I get to go to Gardnerian gathers and things where it's just Gardnerians or people who are Gardnerians along with those interested and there's still a lot of young faces. One of the things I really love about them, there's a lot of uh, people in the trans community who go to those things. So the yeah. idea that, you know, Wicca, and Gar especially Gardnerian and Alexandrian Wicca, is pushing those people out the door just isn't true in my experience because because they're there with us, yeah. well, you know, and a part of everything. Yeah. So you know, I think it's there. But there are people who really don't like Gerald Gardner who are quite loud on TikTok. <laughs> I've noticed that. Yeah. Yeah, but they say things about him that aren't true sometimes. I mean, there was one recently where they're like Gerald Gardner made up the name Maybon. Like, no, no, he did not. No, please stop. No, I know. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a whole different thing to go. That's a whole different. That's a that's a whole hour we could do. Yeah, that's it. Maybe next time. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll ask you one more question, and then and then um, we'll call it a day. Um, if you were to think of three things, and maybe there are more, I don't know, I'm not going to do that kind of like, take three things and stop there. Three gifts that, that Wicca has brought to your life over the years, what would they be? Uh, the first is magic. I mean, I think that's the one thing that most of us really share in common is magic. And I love magic because it allows us to control our circumstances and take control of our lives. And I also just think magic empowers people, right? It makes you confident. It makes you feel like you can stand up for what you believe in. It makes you feel like you can fight the system when you need to fight the system. So magic is so important to me. And the older I get, the more and more important magic becomes. And sometimes it's not even just doing spells specifically. It's about you know, feeling your own power, feeling your will inside of yourself and then projecting that outward. To me, that's mm -hmm. magical. So magic is first. I love my relationships with deities. You know, we talked a lot about Pan, but there's also Dionysus and Kernonos floating around out there. Aphrodite, Persephone, Aradia. You know, we have these household deities and we give them offerings often and they really truly feel like a part of our lives and give us purpose and we feel close to them like they're part of the family. You know, their shrines are in the living room and are fed often. And I love that. And I love the community sense. You know, one of the things about Wiccan witchcraft, especially, is I think it was made to be done by 13 people in a room. Mm. Right? I think you lose something when there's 100 people in the room. I think you lose something when there's only four people in the room. I think it was designed for small groups. And I think it was designed so that we could be close to each other. And I really feel those bonds. I'm not, I don't think Gerald Gardner was a very good writer. And I always tell people not to read Gerald Gardner because it's awful. But <laughs> there's a couple of instances in his writing that are really special. And one point when he talks about death and rebirth, he says, you know, let it be uh, with those that we love so that we might know them and love them again. And to me, Wiccan witchcraft especially, and maybe the greater magical community is a reincarnation cult. You know, you, you meet people and you just feel bonded to them in a way you can't describe really quickly after meeting them. Right. And I truly feel like it's probably some past life thing where we find each other again 
and are close to each other again. And I like to think it's just people in my coven, but I don't think that's the case. I, I think that you and I, a thousand years ago, were out doing something together, yeah. right? We had long hair and we were out doing something together. <laughs> you know, there are other people in the community that, you know, aren't in my coven that I feel the same way about, right? That, and And then the world, as big as it is, there's like attracts like, and we find each other again. And maybe mm. we don't get to see each other as much as we want, or maybe, you know, we go a year or two, maybe even without speaking to each other. But when mm. we get back together, everything works because of that knowing that we had before. That so connection. I really love that. So those, yeah. those are, maybe that was four things, three things somewhere in there. I reckon that was three. And it was, yeah. and, the, and those three things are beautiful things. And I think that connection, I really like that, uh, reincarnation cult idea i really like that it's it it kind of explains that feeling that so many people and listeners to the show will know it too is that when you finally find that you aren't alone um and you find others like you are and suddenly you use that word that it feels like home you know yeah. that, that i've come home um I think that's why my Cauldron Born song is a popular song because that pretty much is what it expresses. Right. You know, that you aren't alone. And when you find out you're not alone, you know, it's such a wonderful feeling. Lovely. Well, thank you, Jason, for spending the time talking to me. How, where can listeners to the show find out more about Jason Mankey? Uh, there are only four Jason Mankeys in the entire world. And ah. I come up first in every search. Much okay. to the wind of the preacher in Indiana. <laughs> so, okay. like, so if you land on that. My wife said that you have to kiss Carrie for her. That's what she said. Okay. So, so that just, I had to throw that in there. Told her last night, I was talking to Dave this morning. She's like, Dave. She's like, oh, Dave? You make sure to tell him to kiss Carrie for me. I shall deliver the kiss very well. <laughs> <laughs> we knew that you would. She's over the allotment at the moment, but when she comes back, I will do that. That's brilliant. Well, thank you, Jason. It's been lovely to speak to you. And Thanks, um, let's great. hope it's not another X amount of years before we see each other again. Absolutely. Bless it be. Bless it be. Lives perceived at different speeds down at the Sycamore Gap, where glacial ice had scarred the land, an ancient tree used to stand. A sycamore full of life and love with the star-clad colourful sky above. It had made its home by the Roman wall where its autumn leaves used to fall. Under its branches had been kisses and tears from a seed it grew for hundreds of years. It had seen kings born and seen queens die. Two world wars flew over its sky. One day a man wrote its name on a map. This beautiful scene coined the Sycamore Gap. The tree it was Northumberland's heart, depicted in song, photo and art, where some asked to be left for eternal life and others asked, will you be my wife? Millions of years since the glacial melt, thousands of years since the wall was built, hundreds of years the Sycamore enjoyed, it took a single night to be destroyed. That ancient tree meant more to me than roots, bark, leaves and sap. Time was perceived differently down at the Sycamore Gap. We are the trees of the seeds that came before us. We are the trees of the earth. We are the trees of the seeds that came before us. And we worship, we worship the seasons of the earth. We are the fruit of the trees that came before us. We are the fruit of the earth. We are the fruit of the trees that came before us. And we worship, we worship the seasons of the earth. We are the seeds 
of the fruit that came before us. We are the seeds of the earth. We are the seeds of the fruit that came before us. And we worship, we worship the seasons of the earth. We are the trees of the seeds that came before us. We are the trees of the earth. We are the trees of the seeds that came before us. And we worship, we worship the seasons of the earth. And we worship, we worship the seasons of the earth. Well, I was sent those two beautiful pieces and it seemed very fitting to play them both together after the sad news of the felling of the old Sycamore Gap tree. The remains of the tree have been removed and the stump fenced off because, you know, sycamores, they're one of those ultimate survivors and next spring that stump may well grow new shoots. It won't look the same, but the spirit hopefully will survive. The poem was sent in by J. Morgan and the chant by A.L. Amael. Well, this music means we are approaching the end of the show, but before I go, let's have the results of last month's competition. The prize was a copy of Professor Ronald Hutton's classic book, Stations of the Sun, and the question I asked was... Well, it wasn't so much of a question, really. I asked you to email me the name of one sun god from history. Well, I received a lot of entries to this one. And the first name drawn from the hat and winner of that brilliant book is Tom Polkinghorn from Plymouth. That is a great name, Tom, with the answer Helios. Rather fitting after the conversation with Jason. Congratulations, Tom. That book will be with you very soon. The prize this month is a copy of Jason's book, The Horned God of the Witches. And the question I'd like you to answer is, who was the first horned god that made themselves known to Jason? Who was the first horned god that made themselves known to Jason? The answer was all over the interview, so not a hard one. Email your answer along with your full postal address to podcast at druidry.org and one of you will win a copy of that brilliant book. And don't forget, we do not keep your information for any other purpose. After the book is sent, all of your details are deleted. It just saves me having to chase the winner for the details of where to send the book. Well, my friends, that is a show. I will see you next month for episode 198. We are creeping ever closer to the 200th show. Wow. But until then, I wish you all a blessed Samhain here in the Northern Hemisphere and a joyful Beltane to all of our listeners in the Southern Hemisphere. Until next month, I wish you all peace and blessed be. Goodbye. (laughs) 